I will not abandon the harvest. I will not abandon the harvest. And it's an incredible story. We're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 23 this morning, verses 11 and 12. We have some Bibles up here again. I see one of them's gone, so somebody's got one. That's great. I'd love to see that. If anybody else needs a Bible this morning, there's another one. If you don't have a Bible at home, come get that one. Take it with you. That will become your Bible. If you do have one at home and you just forgot to bring it, there's two over here to borrow. And that's great. Um, so we're going to be looking again in 2 Samuel um, in chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. And this is an awesome, awesome lesson, and I want to bring a very, very good lesson with it. So since we are going to cover these couple of scriptures, I'm going to ask that we do stand to our feet. And once you get your place there in your scriptures, if you would stand, that way I know when everybody's got their place in the Bible. Um, 2 Samuel 23, verses 11 and 12. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. If you can't stand to your feet, I understand that. But if you can, and it is possible out of reverence of God's word, let's do so. So most people are standing now. Let's go ahead and read these two verses here real quick, and then we'll dig into the word of God. It says, And after him was Shema, the son of Aji, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, um, where was a piece of ground full of lintels. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Let's pray. Dear God, Lord, I pray that you fill this place today with your presence, Lord. Lord, that you would anoint this lesson. Lord God, that you would pierce our hearts with this, Lord God. That you would bring about a change, Lord, inside of us. That you would always be constantly burning a fire that we just can't put out deep in our soul. And Lord God, let us, if we just push you away, make us restless until we get right with you. And until we come back to you and grasp you and just get a hold of you. Lord God, we thank you for everything you do. Lord, just be with us in this lesson today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Alright, we're going to look at this today, but before I do, the scriptures had to come first. I was going to put the story first, but I'm just like, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to put this scriptures first. So, um, I'm going to kind of look at this scripture here for a second. There's this battle going on, right? And they're fighting over a piece of ground with lentil beans in it. Pea patch. That's really what they're fighting over. And so, um, this one guy stood in the, his ground and defended this ground from the Philistines who were coming to take it. There's a story I heard a long time ago called the Starfish Story. Has anybody ever heard of the Starfish Story? I hope nobody has. It's an incredible story. I'm going to read you this story, and then it's going to make sense at the very end of this. The story goes like this. Once upon a time not long ago, there was a terrific storm, right, on the coast. And it was wild and windy, the storm, and it raged all night long. In the morning, a gentleman got ready to make his daily walk to the beach. To his dismay, that particular morning, that particular morning, he saw the great damage this powerful storm had done. Uh, in Florida, we know what that's like, right? We've seen the hurricanes and all this kind of stuff. It can do some serious damage. Driftwood and seaweed and shells were tossed in great confusion all over the beach. Yet what the man noticed most of all were hundreds of starfish. They covered the beach for what seemed like for miles. As far as the eye could see, they were struggling starfishes that had been washed ashore by the storm. He was saddened by the dismay of their plight, knowing he could do nothing to help this trick of nature. As he glanced up the beach, the man noticed a small boy walking towards him in the distance. Every few feet, this little boy would bend down, pick up one of these star struggling starfish, and fling it back into the ocean. The little boy continued his journey with great determination, bending down, picking up these starfish, and flinging them gently back into the sea. As the boy and the man approached each other, the man quietly spoke to the boy. Son, he said, I've been watching you, and it's truly commendable what you've been doing. But I just came from two miles up the beach, and there are starfish as far as the eye can see. There is no way you can possibly make a difference. You're just going to have to let nature take its course and let these starfish die. <clears throat> the little boy looked at the man briefly with a determined glance, and he turned, bent down, picked up a starfish, and flung it gently into the rolling sea. He watched the starfish land, and turning to the older man with a smile, he said it made a difference to that one. It made a difference to that one. This story is so incredible. I got this years ago. It's the funniest thing. Somebody, I was in a church one time, and somebody was teaching a lesson. You know, similar to this, I'm sure. I don't remember what the lesson was. But this was something that they read, and it was incredible because it really started. 
starting to make my mind think. And as I started to prepare this lesson, the funniest thing was last night I told Tisha, I said, God changed my lesson. There's a couple things I got to fit in. So even last night, if you watch my Facebook, at midnight last night, I'm up making changes. And that's one of the things I wanted to add in because it really started to really break down and make sense. And it kind of started to really fit into this lesson. So this morning, we're going to take a look at this lesson. It's called, I Will Not Abandon the Harvest. And you're going to see how this ties into everything going on right now. You've got to think about what's going on here in this story. These Israelites had planted and watered and toiled this ground for an entire season, right? And to plant these lentils, right? These lentil beans in this lentil field here that they're talking about. And um, so finally, they were ready to cultivate, and to, I mean, to, uh, to bring this crop in. It was about harvest time now. So they're getting ready for this harvest. They're getting ready for this time to go out and gather their harvest. And, and then, um, you know, it's a lot of work you get to get to the harvest. How many of you know a farmer? Know a farmer in your life, maybe at least somebody, a few people. I mean, I've got a good friend that's a farmer. I can tell you that is a hard job. <coughs> and what do they depend on? One time of the year. The crazy part about that job is you work all year long for an entire season and just pull it. Like she said, the weather is right, and everything comes together, and you get a bumper crop. Why? Because that's the last chance until the following year, unless they have another source of income, or, you know, sometimes they'll wrap up the bales of hay and things like that, sell the bales of hay, or, you know, to try to make ends meet, too. But for the most part, they depend on that crop that comes one time a year, one time a year only. It's a very difficult job, and you depend on this. And now it's time for them to reap this harvest that they had sown so long for, and what happens? The lentil beans are growing up in the field, and now they look up, and here comes the Philistines. Does this sound familiar to anyone in here today? Just as you, you know, you labor, and you work so hard, and you get everything going, and just about the time that you think, here it is, someone comes in to steal that blessing away, and to snatch that light away from you. And that's what's taking place here today. Just when they're ready to har har you know, harvest, the Philistines would come down and steal their harvest away. You know, we do the same thing in our lives. You know, we, we plant and we water and work. And just when we're ready to reap a harvest, just when you're about to get ahead, just when you see that light at the end of the tunnel, just when, you know, you're about there and you say, yes, I'll finally pay my bills and have a little bit left over. I'll finally do this and have the, you know, God is really working. The church is finally growing. We're just like right at this point where it's about to just take off, right? And then all of a sudden, go into Satan and go, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to take that building away from you, and you'll fall and you'll turn your back. All I have to do is do something to make you stop. I got a word for you. I will not abandon the harvest. I will not abandon the harvest. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy because we're in a battle, and we're in this conflict with the enemy, right? And so the enemy is an enemy of more than what we see here. They're, they're fighting over a little field, right? But there's an enemy that we can't see that's fighting over our soul. Now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're sealed. It's over. His, he can't get your soul anymore, but he can get someone else's. And if he can get you to fall, then he can maybe get use you to try to trick someone else and win their soul. And Satan will intensify his opposition against those who are growing in the Lord. If you've been there and you start to grow in the Lord and you start to cultivate this, this you know, garden in your heart towards God and you start really working towards God, Satan will do what? He'll increase his opposition and he'll send in more, you know, these attacks and he'll try to pull you down. And Tish and I have seriously experienced this this week. But the funny thing is, just when Satan thought he had a hold, I started reaching out. I started reaching out to my sister and family, and all of a sudden, God said, oh no, here comes deliverance. And Tisha and I could stand here and testify to an extreme deliverance from Satan's hand this week. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, to, for this church and everything else, and, you know, all of a sudden, these things start happening, and, and it was just interesting to see how things were going. But Satan starts to begin his attack and starts to really intensify his attack when you start really growing. When you start doing what you're supposed to do, he just starts bringing in more. So the question is, how does Satan attack? What is his ploy? Because here's the thing. The awesome thing about God is where is God? Everywhere. 
God is omnipresent. No one else is. Satan can't be. He can only be in one place at one time. And here's the thing. God is all-powerful, all-knowing. He's an incredible God. Satan is not. So the awesome thing about this is, and we've talked about this before, before Satan can even touch you, he's got to go talk to God if you're a child of God. And he's got to go stand before God just like he did with Job. So the awesome thing is we know he is weak compared to God, and he has nothing on God. But we need to know something. For 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 tells us not to be ignorant of his devices. So we need to know how Satan works and what he's doing. So here's how Satan will attack. Satan will attack through your mind. He's after your mind. And he will come and he'll whisper these little things in your ear. And the thing is, he'll just try to attack your mind and to try to cause you to second guess and to cause you to think about the things you've done. And to try to bring all these things and throw them on your plate to overwhelm you. And he'll try to tear your mind down so he can win this battle. And even if you're a child of God, he'll still do that. He'll still try to get in your ear. He'll still try to tell you, you've just done so many bad things. Don't even go to church. If you go to church, the walls will collapse on you. Don't even go and, and try to sing because your voice isn't good enough. You're just not good enough to get up there and do it. You know, and he'll try to tell you these things to pull you down. Satan is a deceiver, and his target is our minds. He is after your mind. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 says, But I fear... Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What he's trying to do is he's trying to take your mind away from the simplicity right. that is in Christ. He is after your mind. It says it right there. So that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Think of what he did to Eve in the garden. Did he come out and make this big lie up? He shared partial truths. He said, God told you you could eat of all of these trees, right? But did he really say that you could? And then if you do eat of it, he said your mind will be open. It will be open. You'll become like God and you'll be able to understand all these things. And so he starts making these things into their minds. And the next thing you know, he just got in your mind. He got in your head. And that's where he wages his war. So we look at the scripture and we can see that he is waging his war on our minds. Now there is something that I want to share with you. And I want to make a clear statement to you. If you know, I mean if you're a child of God, you are protected from demonic possession. He can't touch you. He cannot cross the bloodline because if he did, that would make him a saved devil. And that's impossible. He can't be a saved devil, so he cannot cross the bloodline. So we know that he can't come inside of us. However, what will he do? Well, he does the same thing we just talked about with Eve and everything. He does these activities to influence your mind because that's his battleground. His battleground is your mind. So he has these activities and these things of influence that he does. So he tries to come around you. And he'll also bring other people around you. And he'll encourage them. If he can't get to you, then he'll bring someone else in. And then they'll get to you. And then all these things will happen so that he can cause you to question things in your mind. And, you know, I've said this before. A lot of times he'll make you even question your salvation. Just because he knows that he can cause you to question it, then he can come in and just steal everything away from you. So what he's going to do is, you know, he can't come in and possess you. But what you've got to watch for is he's always trying to cause these activities and influences to alter your mind. That's his battleground. So now we know what his battleground is. So what's his weapon? What is Satan's weapon? His number one weapon is lies. His number one weapon he will use is lies. And not necessarily, like I said before, not a full-out lie. A lot of times he will use these half-truths, and he'll try to distort things, and he'll even send people into your life that will say, well, that's not what the scripture really says. What the scripture really says is it says this, and sometimes it looks that way, and it won't appear that way, but if you start sowing the word of God into your life, and you're constantly digging in, and you understand the whole scripture, then you can start to understand it. When somebody throws these little garbage things out, and they're trying to tell you, well, you know, this is really what it means, and all, then you'll know right away, but you have to sow the word of God into your life. What happens if you don't? 
then someone can come in and just completely distort your mind with the Word of God. You've got a lot of different faiths out there that believe a lot of different things. So obviously there's a lot of people distorted. Alright, so how do we know his weapon is lies? John chapter 8 and verse 44. And a lot of you probably know this scripture. It says, you are of your father the devil. This is talking to people that do not accept Christ. You are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Or the father of lies. So the thing about Satan that we know is he is the father of lies. He is also the author of confusion. All he wants to do is sow these lies, half-truths, whatever it takes, full out lies if he has to, anything it takes to distort you. Because he knows that if he can distort one person, he can pull a whole church down. You ever seen that happen? You ever see a church just split over one person that came in and started sowing lies? He can take a person that may even know. They may have even accepted Christ and they're just young in their faith. And they come in and, and he starts working on them, right? Because what is he going to try to do? He's going to try to, the, what does a lion do? We talked about lions the other day. What do they do? They don't pick off the strongest one. They try to find the weakest one. And they get in there and they try to attack them. But the biggest thing that we can do as a church is we need to make sure that we're alongside all of our new Christians and people that we see that are not so strong and be encouraging and sowing into them, making sure that we stop by with them and share scripture with them, ask them if we can pray with them, sit down with them in their home and share scripture with them and read scripture and sow into their lives. It's incredible what we see here when people come up and step up and say to me, I want to start. I, I, I never ask them. They come to me and they say, hey, I want to start a, a, a women's Bible study. That's awesome. We need people that are willing to step up and say, hey, I want to sow scripture, more scripture. Sure, we got Sunday morning. Sure, we got Sunday night. Sure, we got Wednesday night. But I think that if we had a women's Bible study where the women can sit down and connect on this emotional level, because you know how women do, and then we can like, really grow, right? Isn't that awesome? And then they end up sitting there all night, still on way home. You know what I'm saying? But that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's awesome the way that, you know, and so this is the way that Satan works. So he likes to twist and distort the truth and make things appear in a certain way. And he tries to make it look like something else happened. And like I said, it, like, you know, you think of Eve in, in the garden and how that worked. You know, there was this interesting story, and I don't know if I can tell you this off the top of my head, but it just popped in my head. But there was these, um... There was this, okay, yeah, I got it. There was this general, and he's sitting next to this guy, and there's a private sitting there. And there's this young girl there, and she's very pretty, fair to look at, and then she's got a mother sitting next to her. And they're all cruising on this train, trying to get to where they're going, you know, and they're just taking this train and everything. And, you know, the, the, the private's sitting there, and he's looking at this book, and every once in a while he just casts a glance up at the girl, you know, to look at her and everything. And he's like, man, she's pretty, you know, and in his head he's thinking this. And, you know, and, and all of a sudden they start coming towards this tunnel. And as they go inside of this tunnel, it's incredible because you hear two sounds. You hear, <laughs> and that's all you hear. And all these people on the train are like, you know, and so, so they, because the, when they went in this tunnel, there was no light. And then they come out the other side, right? And as they come out the other side, this private sitting there like, oh boy, you know. And so everybody starts making accusations. They start thinking right away. That little private was looking at that girl. And he kissed her as soon as there was no one that could see. And that's what people started thinking. So, you know, that's what's going on in the train, the whole train everybody's thinking that. And the girl's sitting there thinking, man, that's the weirdest thing. That little private was looking at me, and he tried to kiss me. But he kissed my mom, and my mom slapped him. <laughs> and my mom really laid on him. And his mother is sitting there thinking, well, good for her. Good for her. That guy tried to kiss her, and she slapped him back. You know, she got him good. You know, she really got him out. And so then the general was sitting there thinking, my goodness, this little pride that tried to kiss that girl, and that girl hauled and tried to hit him and got me. And the pride is sitting there, and he's all content in his mind, and he thinks this is the funniest thing. He's trying not to laugh, and he's sitting there thinking, man, this is incredible. Everybody thinks I just kissed that hot girl, and I just got to slap this general for no reason. <laughs> Because Satan 
likes to make you perceive something when it's not really what it is. The whole time, this private just took advantage of a chance to slap the general. <laughs> and I served four years in the Marine, so I can respect that sometimes. <laughs> anyway, so you know, Satan does that though, doesn't he? I mean, seriously, have you ever seen a circumstance where, you know, something will happen in the church or even in your home life, and you'll think, oh, that was just wrong of them to do that? I can't believe they just did that to me. And then later on, you're talking to someone, and they come in, and they're talking about this event that happened, and they're sharing with you, and you understand. And then all of a sudden, you realize that was never their intention to start with. It came across to you that way, and you perceived it that way, and you jumped to make a judgment when it really was not their intention. I've been there before. I'll be honest with you. I've taken times before where I thought that somebody had tried to do something to wrong me, and then find out they didn't even do anything to wrong me. And here I had, you know, in my mind, cast judgment. Now, thank goodness we don't, I, I'm hoping that we're operating a lot more in this spirit. Now, I've grown a long way since then, you know, but still as a human, I still stumble, I still fall. You know, sometimes, you know, and I was talking to them too about this, I said, sometimes people think that because we're a pastor, we're perfect. I've got a word for you. We're not perfect. We do the best we can, just like everybody else. We struggle the same way everybody else does. There's no one that's perfect. We'll always be human. On the flip side of that, because I am a child of Jesus and I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I am perfect and holy, unreprovable before God, as I said last week. All right, so what is Satan's purpose? He has a twofold purpose. Satan has a twofold purpose. His primary purpose is first to create a separation between you and God. That's his first goal. His number one goal is not to really, you know, necessarily destroy everything. His goal, number one, is just to cause a little separation between you and God. Why would he do that? Because if he can break that separation between you and God, he breaks that perfect communion between you and God. And then he takes away your anointing, and he takes away your Holy Spirit around you, the, you know, your cloak that's around you, God's protection, he takes all that away from you. And then his second goal is to make you ignorant of God's will. So he'll come in and just cause a little bit of separation, and once he has that back door open, He'll come in and just start stealing everything, you know, and just start robbing you of everything that you have. He can even use other Christians to confuse you on what God's will is. So you have to be very careful because he may not, you know, you may be perfect. You know, you may come in with a spirit back around you and you just can feel the spirit just dripping off you. And then another Christian comes in that he's just caused them to do a little bit of separation. And so they come in and they start causing these things and start saying things. Next thing you know, it's causing division. It's causing you, you know, your mind to start getting weak. And you've got to really watch. Because you've got to, like, if your, start, your spirit starts discerning. And it's starting to tell you, be careful, be careful, be careful. Sometimes we don't want to listen to that. We say, you know, is that really God talking to me or is it just my mind, you know? And so then, you know, next thing you know, you know, Satan's got us in this big mud puddle with mud up to our knees. And then God's going to come in and wash us off again. So we got to be very, very careful because he'll use anything and sometimes even other Christians to confuse you on what God's will is. Getting back to the story, in 2 Samuel 23 and verse 11, if you look towards the end of that verse, it's sad what it says. It says, and the people fled from the Philistines. The people fled from the Philistines. Listen, if we keep turning our back on Satan, he'll rob you of everything you have. If they would have all ran off from that lentil field, it would have been over. See, then these Philistines would have came in and just devoured that whole thing and taken their whole entire harvest and ran off with it. He'll steal your joy. He'll steal your blessings. He'll steal your happiness, your children, your healing, your testimony, your future, and he will leave you with nothing but an empty lentil field. An empty pea patch, completely stripped down. If I was to ask, you know, if I was to ask everyone here, how many of you have children that have just turned their back on God? There would be people that would come up here and raise their hands and probably fall on their face before God as a result. There's people that have, that have felt that sting of what it's like when your children, you know, turn their back on God. You know, but Satan will do these kinds of things. He'll try to come in and steal anything that he can. So you need to be stumbling into the lives of our children constantly. You know, scriptures tell us if we, you know, raise our children up in the way, in the nurture and admonition of God, that they will not depart from it when they get older. And that's the most important thing we can do. But I believe 
that it is time right now that we stop running and start standing firm in our pea patch. We need to start standing firm in our harvest fields and stop letting Satan come in and destroy and set fire and take everything that we have because all he's got to do is take you, you know, just a little bit, a little space. You know, have you ever seen a, a field when they're done, what they do with them? They'll burn them off sometimes. Up in Georgia, they would burn these fields off. And it was amazing because they would start this little fire in the corner. And what would it do? It would just rage across the field. It didn't take no time at all. Have you ever seen a forest fire when you watch them on TV? It's crazy. One little cigarette butt that somebody just flicks out or whatever will start a fire and burn an entire forest off. Acres and acres will be eaten up. If Satan can just get that little spark in, he can set a forest fire that will just destroy so much. You know, I can imagine these Philistines coming down this hill in the scripture. And you know, the Israelites sitting there in their field that they had toiled for so long over. And they look up and they see these spears and all this armor and, and, and these horses and whatever they're coming down on them with. And they can see them all coming. And they're like, look at that. That's huge. There's no way. We got to turn and run. We got to run. And so they take off and they start to run and they start to leave this pea patch that they worked so hard for. And leave their little field right there and just, and just abandon their harvest field. And so, they, you know, I picture this in my mind, and I picture how it must have looked. And then all of a sudden they turn back and they see Shema standing there in the field. And, and the, you know, the sword out, he's ready to defend this field. And they're like, Shema, what are you doing? Don't be stupid. Don't try to be a hero. Just give them the field. Just let them have it. You can't win. Look how many there are. That's a lot. And they're coming to take this field. We're running. All of us. You're the only one. Are you crazy? And Shema says, I will not abandon my harvest. I've sown this whole field for a season to let the enemy come down and to take this away from me. Are you kidding me? I am not going to turn my back. I believe we can have a victory. I believe God will grant us this victory today because we're not operating under the human power. We're operating under a power of Almighty God. Amen. And I believe that we can stand here and get the victory, and I am not going to leave my pea patch. This is our pea patch. This is not their lentil field. We worked hard on this. We've sown for this. We've watched the rain for this. We've prayed over the rain for this. And you're going to walk away and let the enemy come in and steal what we've done? Really? And so he says, you know, I can imagine if it was me, I would just look at these people and be like, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Grab your armor, put on the full armor of God, and get in this field with me now. This is our field. But unfortunately, they ran off. And he stood there and defended this field on his own because he refused to leave his pea patch. You know, friends, I have... A word for you today. Here at the Cross Christian Church, I declare right now, though the enemy might be many, there may be legions fighting against this place. And they may be coming down to destroy us. They may tell us, you can't put a banner on the front of this property that says Jesus on it. And I don't want to see crosses in that building. And I don't want, you need, you need to deny Jesus Christ because he's merely a prophet. And they may say all these things to us, but we're just We'll just move our building where we can serve God even better. Where we can be there seven days a week, not two. And where we can wage a better war on God, on Satan. And where we can stand in the power of God and say, I will not abandon my pea patch ever again. And I will stand here, but I will not run. And if you run me through with your swords or whatever, I'll die with pea pods hanging from my pockets. But I will not go down without a fight. And I will stand here to defend what we started with in the first place. Because there's no honor in turning your back and running. When God's given you his armor and he says, listen to me, what did he say that we've said so many times from this place? I will be your shield and your buckler. Absolutely. Say it again. I'll be your buckler. Your shield and your buckler. I will come. I'll put my shield on you. I'll be your buckler. What is a buckler? The person that comes and puts their armor on you and buckles you up. In the military, I know what that's like because there's times where you can't put a full-out mop suit on without someone helping you. 
And so, you know, God says, look, don't be weary. I will come in. I will be your shield and your buckler. Why are we going to let anyone stop us from reaping the harvest that we've already started? We will not let anyone come up here and stop us. We have started to build something really big. The momentum has started. We're starting to reap the harvest. We can see more people coming in every single week. And, you know, it started with three. It started with three, and then it was five, and then it was three, and then it was seven, and then it was five, and then it was, you know, and now look, you know, it's starting to grow, and, you know, God's anointing this place, and God's saying, you know, this is time, we're ready to take off, and then the enemy tries to come in and steal everything, and I'm just standing here thinking, oh, no, you don't. You, you I may be small, I may be five, five, versus some of these people that are like six, seven feet tall, whatever, you know, I may only be five, five, but my shield and my buckler is way bigger than anyone that walks Amen. the face of this earth. Amen. Right. Amen. So sadly, many churches before the Cross Christian Church have abandoned their pea patch. And they've walked off and left their lentil fields to be destroyed and to be overrun by Satan. People think it's just too hard, I have to quit. Our goal is written on the bulletins that you should have in your hand. And it says what our statement is, is to make a major change in Pasco County. Our goal is to see a major change in the local community. And we will not quit and we will not back down. We will stand and fight the seen and the unseen enemy. Amen. Because I may not see him, but God can. Amen. And God knows exactly what he's doing. And here's another thing. I don't know what your opinion is, and I, you know, frankly, it's not important. But you know, some pastors out there, and one of them that says this a lot is Joel Osteen, and he'll say, you know, you can either be a victim or be a victor. Right. It's such a small change in the word. But at the same time, I choose not to ever go down a victim. Because I know that I'll be a victor either way. It doesn't matter. Because one day, even if give my life for Christ, I'll stand before God as a victor. And I'll reign with him and come back to rule and to reign with Christ. Our harvest is right here. Right here in Newport Ritchie and throughout the county. As your pastor and as a church, our harvest is right here. And we will not back down. Think about this. There was a terrible storm. And there were starfish washed up as far as the eye could see, struggling and in pain, about to die. And this little boy says, it made a difference to that one. Look outside the doors. There's a whole lot of starfish out there going through a storm in their life. And they're struggling, and they're laying on their back, and they're trying, and they're doing everything that they can. And if we stop, and we don't carry the word of God to them, then we're failing. Yeah. We're failing. I talked to a pastor the other day that's a pastor of this huge church, and he's a, he's, a, he's a very, very strong man of God. And he came from Oral Roberts and down through that island. He's extremely knowledgeable in his word. And I sat there and I talked to him for a moment, and he says to me, he says, Pastor James, I have one question for your church. Does your church soul in? And I said, yeah, we do. We go out and we minister on the streets. And we have a street ministry team and everything. We try to bring people in. And we've already brought almost, you know, 17, 12 to 17 people to Christ since we opened. And we've baptized about that many. And he says, here's the deal. God cannot bless your church 100% unless you're sold in. Because our number one job is to do what? To get out there. To find those starfish that are struggling and to save and to bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ. Because if we don't, they're going to struggle. And when we look and we say, it's just so many. They're all on pills and, and, and they're giving their life over to this lifestyle. And there's just no way I can make a change. That I, I just pray that we are known as that church, that little boy that walked around and said, you know what? Irregardless of what the world is saying and these other churches are saying made a difference to that. It made a difference to that. We need to be doing everything we can to be reaching the people, the people in this area that are feeling washed up and are struggling and having a hard time. They're right here. They're right under our noses. I was looking for specific numbers so I could give you guys this. 
how many people are unchurched in Pasco County, and all this kind of stuff, and I don't, I can't find it, like a new one. But I can tell you that there are thousands and thousands of people. How many of you were at our event the other day, the Business Development Week? How many people said they're looking for a good church, and they feel like they just can't find one, and every time they get into one, it's like they're all about themselves and all about, you know, it's crazy. Why are we not about everyone else? Why aren't we walking up to these people and saying, hey, why don't you come to church when you see people with a cross on or you see people with anything on? Why aren't you going up and challenging them? What does that cross mean to you? Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Well, you should come to this church and see this church. You don't even invite them to this church. You should go to church somewhere, anywhere that teaches the word of God. But our church would be a great place. It's time to stand up and to step out and to send his, <coughs> Satan and his little minions a clear message that we will not abandon the harvest. The Cross Christian Church will not back down and we will not put God in a box.